As his press biography used to say, David Lynch is an Eagle Scout from Missoula, Montana. When asked about his childhood, David would later recall that he felt happy, but occasionally uncomfortable and afraid of his environment, a condition he would later classify as agoraphobia. He would also recall a very specific image that summed up his feelings about childhood. Quote, My youth was a dream world, those droning airplanes, blue skies, picket fences, green grass, cherry trees. Middle America as it was supposed to be. But then on the cherry tree, there would be this pitch oozing out, some of it black, some of it yellow. And there were millions and millions of red ants racing all over the sticky pitch, all over the tree. So you see, there's this beautiful world and you just look a little bit closer and it's all red ants. Blue Velvet's opening scene depicts an ideal suburb beset upon by darkness when an old man has a heart attack. As we view this scene, the camera pans down to show the nasty bugs that have always existed underneath the well-manicured lawn. This image can serve as a thesis for Lynch's entire career. However, it is not the cynical criticism of Americana that many people interpret it as being. Rather, it shows that light and darkness exist together, and that to recognize one, you must also recognize the other. It is not until he has gone to hell and back that our protagonist is able to recognize the beauty of the Robins. This combination of the light and the dark, of the underground bugs and the white picket fences. This all goes to show a philosophy of dualism which Lynch has carried throughout his career, showing dark and light as being both opposing forces and also necessary and even part of one another. So when it came to write a TV series, the same philosophy applied. <laughs> Twin Peaks is a show defined by an odd balance of different emotional tones. The murder of Laura Palmer and the investigation of Dale Cooper slowly reveals all the town's dark secrets, but it also reveals a lot of beauty. Every moment of darkness is balanced by light. Surrealism and absurdity is used to express horror as much as it is used to create wacky comedic moments. Laura Palmer herself existed on a razor's edge between the dark and the light, and it is this combination that allowed us to see her true beauty. She is the embodiment of the show, the town, and Lynch's overall vision. The one leading to the many is Laura Palmer. Laura is the one. After the studio forced decision to solve the Laura Palmer murder killed the show's core story, it was hard to know how Twin Peaks could continue. Season 2 became a frankly embarrassing mess until Lynch stepped back in for a truly jaw-dropping finale that unfortunately did not manage to keep the show on the air. By the time it was released, the show had already been cancelled and even getting that finale released was only due to a fan write-in petition. The show, for the most part, had lost its cultural moment altogether. The mystery was solved and people felt that it was over. So 25 years later, what story could the return, as it was called, possibly tell? Well, it's one that was already being revealed in Fire Walk With Me. At the beginning of Fire Walk With Me, we meet a person who is not Cooper, but strikingly similar, visiting a town similar to Twin Peaks to investigate a murder similar to Laura Palmer. Before they go, they meet with the actual David Lynch, playing Gordon Cole, the director of the FBI, who shows them someone he calls his mother's sister's girl. The girl is dressed in red, with a blue rose, and she does some odd movements, followed by Lynch himself doing some odd hand gestures. Although confusing, later it is told to us that the odd presentation we are just given was filled with clues from what to expect from the case. Remember Lil's wearing a sour face. We're going to have problems with the local authorities. Both eyes blinking means trouble higher up. The eye is the local authority. 
Cole said Lil was his mother's sister's girl. Now, what's missing in that sentence? The uncle. Not Cole's uncle, but probably the sheriff's uncle's in federal prison. Let me ask you something, Stanley. Did you notice anything about the dress? The dress was altered to fit her. I noticed a different colored thread where the dress was taken in. Gordon said you're good. To understand what we are about to see, we must be like investigators. Not investigators on a literal logical level, but investigators of symbols of the soul. Soon after, the investigators entered Deer Meadow, the aforementioned Twin Peaks double. However, Deer Meadow isn't exactly like Twin Peaks. Everything is worse. It is darker, more decayed. People are mean, buildings are run down, and most importantly, the coffee is very bad. Why don't you have some coffee, man? It was fresh about two days ago. <laughs> There was a murder of a young girl, but people don't seem to care very much. Even the way it is filmed feels more like a dark, edgy crime drama than the high school soap opera that Twin Peaks started out as. It's a place that has been allowed to decay, and slowly the darkness has overtaken it. It is a place where evil has won. What we see in this dark reflection is a warning of what will happen if Twin Peaks' light is not maintained, if the balance is upset. While the original Twin Peaks connection to soap operas can give the impression that the town would be just how it is forever and ever, with many dramas and mysteries happening, but the core soul of the town never changing, what Deer Meadows shows is that no, this is not something which is secure and stable. This is something very fragile, which can go away if you don't take care of it. And in this way, by seeing the darkness, we are able to appreciate the beauty that Twin Peaks possesses. However, most audience members did not see or outright rejected the ideas being put forward. Fire Walk With Me was a bomb. People in general did not like it, and it's only recently that it's been reappraised by fans. So, 25 years later, after this poor reception, these ideas were presented in a new and powerful way. See, it's one thing to see something which is already decayed when you don't even know how it started. It's another thing to watch something you know very well decay in front of your eyes. There is no beauty greater or more cruel than beauty which only exists in memory. Nostalgia, the pain of wanting to return. Hello, I stand in school for... I'll see you again in John C. Javier's... Meanwhile... And I'll see you... And you... Gone are the soap opera tropes of the original series, and gone is the warm glowing cinematography. The new Twin Peaks takes on a new style, cold, slow, methodical, and with the definitive arc to its story which wasn't present in the original series. As Lynch described it, this version of the show would be an 18 hour movie. And in both tone and style, it is much closer to Twin Peaks the movie, Fire Walk With Me, than it is to the original series. 
The news show much more closely resembles his later works like Lost Highway and Inland Empire than it does Blue Velvet. There are many visual references to his previous works from the black and white episode greatly influenced by Eraserhead, the inclusion of many of Lynch's previous collaborators, and even minor details that call upon his work in other mediums. And of course, there's also the inclusion of music he produced himself and music by longtime collaborators. These extra textual elements become text through our main cast. The story is about the passage of 25 years, but in reality, of course, the cast itself has aged 25 years, and it's impossible to ignore this. Age, decay, mortality are baked into the show, both in and out of the universe. Many cast members have died, and their characters are either missing or have been radically transformed. And many other cast members died shortly after filming their parts. The one that really gets to me is Katherine Coulson's final performance as the Log Lady, which was filmed only four days before her death. Catherine is not only the Log Lady, she's a longtime collaborator with Lynch ever since his first film, A Razorhead, a production which introduced her to her first husband, Jack Nance, who played Eraserhead and later would play Pete Martell on Twin Peaks. Pete is absent from season three as Jack Nance had already passed away before filming, and now Catherine is here giving her final performance for the show that obviously meant so much to the both of them. It's a moment that I don't think would have been possible without her and Lynch's long relationship, and I feel genuinely privileged to be able to see something like this. This final moment is something that goes a bit beyond fiction and enters our reality in a way which is painful and beautiful, dark and light. In Alan Moore's comic book, Watchmen, the superhuman character Dr. Manhattan brushes aside concerns of mortality from his human counterparts. He says, quote, a live body and a dead body contain the same number of particles. Structurally, there's no discernible difference. Life and death are unquantifiable abstracts. Death is a transformation or possibly the negation of a kind of energy. When someone dies, we say they are gone. So what would we say if a body was moving, living, breathing? just like a normal person, but not possessing the same life force. On the flip side, what if we took this life force and put it into another form? Would we still be the same person? While we can say that Bob possessed Leland to kill Laura, we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be possessed? How much of Leland was actually doing these actions and how much was it Bob using Leland's body? Leland's body doesn't transform in any way. This is a question of the soul and a question of identity, not just how a person identifies themselves, but how we identify the people in our lives. The hints we get as to how much control Leland Palmer had seems conflicted. Laura in the Red Room says that her father killed her, not mentioning Bob. When Leland appears in the Red Room in season three, he seems genuinely concerned for Laura, possibly unaware of what's happened, and notably he doesn't have the white eyes of the doppelgangers. This appears to be the real Leland Palmer reacting. In season two, when the doppelganger Leland appears, he says, I did not kill anybody. It's hard to know exactly what the doppelganger means by this, and if we should even trust him. Is he saying Leland Palmer did not kill anybody, and that it was just Bob and Leland was a puppet? Or is he mocking Cooper's assumption that it was Bob behind it all the entire time, when actually it was Leland doing these things with Bob just feeding off of the energy? So who killed Laura Palmer? Well, it seems like we actually don't know. These questions of identity were always present at Twin Peaks with its many twins, doppelgangers, and repeated names, but they become a focal point in season three. People's souls are moved between dimensions and into different physical forms. 
the arm, Philip Jeffries, Diane. Often multiple souls will share one body, such as Leland and Bob, Mr. C and Bob, Sarah Palmer and Judy. Sometimes people's bodies may be identical while their souls are different, such as Mr. C, Cooper, and Dougie. Most interestingly to me are the tulpas, which are supposedly manufactured Black Lodge entities, copies of real people. You would assume an entity like this would be lacking a human soul, and sometimes that appears to be the case. However, when Diane breaks down and cries while talking about her sexual assault at the hands of Mr. C, another Black Lodge entity, we can't help but feel that this is real in some way. And I think a lot of kudos here has to go to one of Lynch's longest collaborators, the actress Laura Dern, who is absolutely wonderful and brings a level of reality to this description of sexual assault that it really makes us think deeply about what it would mean to be a tulpa. What does it mean to be manufactured as a person? Because this pain she's expressing, whatever you think this thing, this person is, that pain is real, which means that soul is real. Diane's tulpa has all of Diane's memories. She has apparently been able to live her life for 25 years despite only being a copy. So what makes her less real than the real Diane? Likewise, Dougie Jones is a Cooper tulpa, but apparently has been able to take on a whole new life completely separated from Cooper's. In this scenario, it is actually our real Cooper who becomes a false Dougie Jones when he's transported back into our world and is mistaken for Dougie Jones himself. Our Cooper fully inhabits Dougie Jones' life to the point where most people will just refer to this version of Cooper as Dougie Jones, even though the real Dougie Jones disappeared at the beginning of this story in a very tragic way too. This was a person with a whole life, but it was a life that was manufactured. He was a man that was built to die, and in his death he won't be mourned because he will just be replaced by something else. There's a very grim kind of existential horror to that type of idea, being born to die and not being missed. It's tragic in a way that's hard to wrap your head around. In the end, Cooper goes back to his own life and creates another tulpa who will be the new Dougie Jones, but is that Dougie Jones real or is the real Dougie Jones gone forever? And this is just one more copy impersonating another person. And how much does it matter? Through all this, we have to ask ourselves, well, what makes a person real? Likewise, many audience members have to ask themselves while watching season three, is this actually Twin Peaks? It's the same people and locations that we love, but does it feel like Twin Peaks? Diane knows the fake Cooper when she sees him just because he feels different. Likewise, the real Cooper knows the real Diane for the same reason. So what do we accept as real? If a person can look exactly like someone we know, but they don't act the same way that we're used to, does that make them not that person anymore? What if you met someone that looked completely different, but did act in the same way that the person you knew always acted? Same memories and everything. Mr. C is the character that disturbs me the most on rewatch, but not just because of Bob being this pure evil force, but rather that Mr. C may not be the simple pure evil clone I first assumed. Mr. C is strikingly similar to Cooper in a lot of ways. He does commit horrible atrocities, but they are always in service of solving a case. Discovering who Judy is and entering the Black Lodge on his own terms, these are mysteries that Mr. C is trying to solve, but also these are mysteries that Cooper is trying to solve. And in fact, when Cooper re-enters our world, he picks up the investigation immediately where Mr. C left off when he was killed at the sheriff's office. In retrospect, even his pure evil acts, like sexually assaulting the women in Cooper's life, these all serve an end goal. 
Sex and fear are both ways to trigger Lodge energy, and Mr. C uses these forces to create Tulpa versions of Diane and Audrey who both serve his long-term goals. Tulpa Diane acts as an informant within the FBI, while Audrey both gives birth to Richard who becomes an accomplice and eventual sacrifice to Mr. C's goals and remains trapped in Twin Peaks, possibly near the Red Room's entrance for reasons that are unclear. <laughs> Is that Ghostwood here? Mr. C has an awareness of his artificial nature and fights against it in a way that other doppelgangers do not. This reflects Cooper's own intuition towards the spiritual realm, and how he too attempts to manipulate it, leading also to disastrous results. In fact, Mr. C's pursuit of Judy can be read as an attempt to meet his creator before his time is up a kind of spiritual quest not too far off from the spiritual quests that Cooper himself enjoys. Now, am I saying that Cooper would have committed these acts on his own if he was not brought into the Lodge? No, I'm not saying that at all. I, I love Cooper. <laughs> but could he have? Is there a part of him that would have gone down this road? That's not something that we have an answer to, and it's a much more disturbing question. One that's brought to the forefront when Cooper, or Richard, that we see in the final episode, acts in ways that feel like a combination of both the good Coop that we know and love, and the evil Coop, Mr. C. Well, there's many theories on who Richard actually is, that question, again, isn't as important as the act of asking the question itself. If we can't figure out what version of Cooper this is, then what does that say about how well we know Dale Cooper? What does that say about the good Coop that we loved? The beautiful white knight? Likewise, if we don't know if it was really Bob or Leland who killed Laura, what does that say about our knowledge of Leland himself? All of these challenges to the core concepts, the characters that we know, forces us to ask the question which is key to all of this. Is this the person that I know? Was it Bob who really killed Laura Palmer? Or do we just want to believe that? Because reckoning with the idea of a father being able to repeatedly assault and then murder his own daughter is too horrifying to think about. It's a world of truck drivers. Twin Peaks is a quintessentially American show steeped in American imagery. The coffee, the cherry pie, the Douglas firs, even the names of the citizens of Twin Peaks are classic Americana. James as in James Dean, Audrey as in Audrey Hepburn, Dale Cooper as in D.B. Cooper, a connection which becomes more interesting after his disappearance in season two. It is the idealized American small town, even with all of its darkness. The darkness serves to highlight the beauty of it, the true beauty of this small town. It's a vision of the country, which is beautiful, at least initially. The return shows us in so many ways, an America that is painfully familiar to us now, very detached from the idealized vision of the original show. Twin Peaks is decaying, falling into ruin, inequality is rampant, poverty all too common, people are sick and lacking proper health care, they are deeply disturbed and instead of mental health support, they receive enraged propaganda from false prophets trying to sell cheap products. Then when we get sick, the pharmaceutical companies make billions! They own the fucking hospitals, filled to the brim. They own the morgues. They own the embalming fluids. 
They own the mortuaries, the graveyards, these fucks. Dig yourself out of the shit. $29.99. That's right. Only $29.99 plus shipping. Except no substitute. The police force is corrupt. Crime is rampant. People are selling their blood to survive. Well, that's just something. You've been selling your blood again? Yes. Here's 50 bucks for the work. Plus, don't pay me for any rent this month. What? Rent is due soon. Don't pay it this month. And the next time you're thinking about selling your blood, come talk to me about it. I don't like it. I don't like people selling their blood to eat. It's true the hospital medical people need people to donate blood, but you've given enough already. Yes, sir. Keep your blood, Chris. Yes. And underage women are becoming victims of the sex trade by people so unashamed of their own crimes, they will talk about it openly in the workplace. I sent him two. He owes me for two. What? I don't know their names. Uh, he wanted blondes. I sent him two blondes. What? Fuck. I, how old? They had IDs. They both had good IDs. Look, this has nothing to do with the Roadhouse. Roadhouse has been owned by the Renault family for, for 57 years. We're not going to lose it now because of a, a couple of 15-year-old straight-A students. No, no. <laughs> Those girls, they are whores, pure and simple. From what I hear, though, they were straight-A whores. <laughs> This new generation of characters we see are poorer, sicker, angrier, and more cruel. Although they did not start this process of decay, they are both proponents of it and victims of it. Stuck in a cycle of trauma and abuse that started before they were born, moments of cruelty in the show echo previous seasons but in much more brutal ways. The most obvious example to me being the abusive relationship Shelley's daughter is stuck in that reflects her own abuse in some ways but is far more cold, brutal, and lacking in any hope for change. This relationship also connects to another clear example of this cycle which has a direct correlation to our real world, the drug trade. While the drugs are not labeled as opioids in Twin Peaks, the connection to the opioid epidemic in America is obvious in that most of the victims are poor, white, small town folk. With Twin Peaks' economy falling into ruin after the mill burned down, many are earning their income selling hard drugs or they become victims of addiction. People live in darkness and consume drugs to escape or sell them to gain some safety, which then contributes further to the descent of the town. With no doctors or therapists to treat the addicted, and seemingly no opportunity for the poor and uneducated, this cycle of consumption and descent is allowed to continue indefinitely. Watching the cycles of people's lives spiral further and further into decay and violence, it often feels as if Twin Peaks itself is suffering from a kind of spiritual sickness, from the imbalance of dark and light. Of course, all these dark elements did exist in Twin Peaks before, but they seemed smaller and more balanced by the light. However, when you look at what we've been shown before and after the events of the original series, how much of that can we say was reality and how much was our own perception? In hindsight, it seems that the original Twin Peaks we watched was not a fully truthful depiction of what that world was. It was naive. This flashback episode, episode 8 of season 3, brings us back to the origin of the extreme negative entity Judy who led to the birth of Bob as well as a new entity called the Woodsman. This moment of the nuclear bomb being set off and creating Judy could be seen as the real moment where the scales tipped. And since then, Twin Peaks has been in a slow decline. Maybe it's not Cooper's absence that caused this world to decay. Maybe it's that we were only able to see the decay occurring when we, like Cooper, stepped away for a moment and came back. 
It's in this episode that we get our most clear understanding of what evil is in the world of Twin Peaks. This is the water. And this is the well. Drink full and ascend. The horse is the white of the eyes and dark within. This is the water. And this is the well. Drink full and ascend. This is the water, and this is the well. Drink full, and descend. What I interpret this poem as meaning is the following. This man's suffering, his pain and his sorrow, is our water, the thing which we feed upon. And his physical form is our well, which we will draw this water from. Consume this evil force, this product of suffering, and descend into darkness. Now, of course, the key to this is that he is not just saying this to himself. This message goes out on the radio, and the drink full and descend is not just a warning of what these lodge entities will do, but it is a call for the citizens of Twin Peaks themselves to engage in this action. It is an invitation and a call to arms. This is what evil does in the world. It feeds on human suffering. Bob is frequently described as hungry. All the Black Lodge and Red Room entities are seen to feast on Garmin Bosia, which is considered the pain and suffering of humans. Bob is also strongly connected to fire, as in fire walk with me. He is an energy that only exists as long as he can feed on something. Garmin Bosia, pain and suffering. Even the helpful arm character, which assists Cooper in some of his journeys, doesn't care at all for the sanctity of life. All he wants is to feed on the Garmin Bosia, which Bob stole from him. They are consumers of the human soul. Bob is described as the evil that men do. Evil, in this sense, is not just random cruelty. It has a desire that must be fulfilled. This is the evil that has consumed Twin Peaks. And now, with season three expanding outwards, we can say this is the evil that has consumed America. Through the darkness of future past, the magician longs to see one chance out between two worlds. Fire, walk with me. The Native American imagery of Twin Peaks, while at first appearing a bit simplistic or even appropriative, gains a new meaning with the events of season three. Something is missing, and you have to find it. What is it? The way you will find it has something to do with your heritage. The spirits of Twin Peaks have been around since long before the town was built and were well understood by the native people. It is said that the woods themselves contain spirits. The wood holds many spirits, doesn't it, Margaret? The forest is literally called ghost woods, a forest of spirits. And what is Twin Peaks, the town, based around? A lumber mill. And I do warn you that what I'm about to go into is some dark and controversial places, 
but I do think what I'm about to say is in line with the show's mythology and more importantly its themes about good versus evil. The colonization of America and the resulting genocide of the Native American tribes, their cultures, and their civilizations is one of the worst atrocities in human history and something we have yet to reckon with. It is a darkness so massive it's impossible to fully comprehend. Twin Peaks the town is a white settler community built atop a land which was once occupied by native tribes. The lumber mill consumes the woods, consumes the spirits of the land, slowly creating further and further unbalance in the spiritual world. The mill itself is burnt down over an act of greed and acts of unbalanced consumption. I previously mentioned Bob being closely connected to fire, but fire is just one form of energy, and there's another form that this energy can take. Electricity in the show is described as a kind of fire, specifically a magic fire that the Native American people were aware had connections to the spiritual realm. Looks like a campfire. What is this? It's not a campfire. It's, it's a, a fire symbol. Is that me? It's a, a type of fire, more like, like modern day electricity. The entities of the Black Lodge are able to use electricity to cross between the two worlds and to gain more influence over our physical world. As Twin Peaks becomes more and more industrial, the evil consuming the town becomes more and more powerful. The atomic bomb which creates Judy marks the point where there may not be any return. The nuclear explosion in this instance is humanity's greatest fire, and therefore it creates the greatest evil. America in the real world shares this history as well, of genocide, of mass consumption, of domination, and the destruction of the natural world. And in the real world too, we are seeing things become so unbalanced that soon there may be no way of fixing it. When this kind of fire starts, it is very hard to put out. The tender boughs of innocence burn first, and the wind rises, and then all goodness is in jeopardy. These are not problems that can be undone either. When a log burns, you cannot unburn it. Cooper attempts to do this by going back and bringing Laura Palmer back from the dead, believing he can undo all this darkness by preventing the murder from happening in the first place, undoing the case that his life had become dedicated to. But he's mistaken. Laura was not the key to all this darkness. She was just an example of it rising to the surface. And moreover, what happened to her did happen. Even going back and undoing it would just cause a new version of history, a new story. What story is that, Charlie? Is that the story of the little girl who lived on the lake? In this final moment, Cooper walks away from his creator, the man who literally sent him on the journey, both as director Gordon Cole and the director of Twin Peaks itself, David Lynch. Cooper, like Wyndham Earl before him, in his attempts to use the powers of the spiritual realm to fulfill his desires, ends up falling victim to its power. There are many ways to read the ending of season three, and some of them are legitimately happy and fairly believable. But to me, I cannot help but take the blood-curdling screams of Laura Palmer as a clear sign that what has happened here is deeply, deeply wrong. Although he had noble intentions in mind, our white knight Dale Cooper does something really bad here. Laura was given the chance to move on, and she took it. In Fire Walk With Me, we saw her ascend to what appeared to be heaven. 
Cooper snatches that away from her. Cooper, like the evil that we've been talking about, attempts to dominate the world instead of having an equal relationship with that. Cooper tries to dominate the spiritual realm, and that is his biggest mistake. As I mentioned earlier, one of the keys to Lynch's style comes from the idea that to know true beauty, you must also know true horror and vice versa. But there's another side to this darkness. That's not look at the horror at all, to not understand it as real will destroy you. Films like Lost Highway and Mulholland Drive show characters literally splitting into alternate realities and alternate identities because of how unwilling they are to face the horrors of their lives. Leland Palmer is possessed, but we could just as easily interpret Bob as being his way of coping with the violence he chooses to commit. Many characters in season three are stuck in an imagined past and it destroys them. James can't let go of his teen image and becomes a sad, lonely man, while Bobby learns to recognize his own flaws and grows from them. Part of what destroyed Laura Palmer was the people in her life being unable to accept both her dark and light side as being one and the same. They couldn't accept her as a fully complex human being, and as such, she was left completely alone to fend for herself even when she was surrounded by friends. You must see the darkness and the light together. You must see the black pitch and how beautiful it makes the rest of the tree. We can't keep reaching back to this imagined past of Twin Peaks as Dale Cooper once presented it to us. Dale, instead of fixing the problems of Twin Peaks, tries instead to return to the idealized image he once had by removing the event that caused him to wake up to the darkness underneath his special town. Of course, this is the reality we live in now too, with so many people trying desperately to reach back into a past that never existed. Not just with the Make America Great Again crowd, but also liberals who are unwilling to accept the reality of the country they live in, who instead desperately try to undo the event that made them see the bugs underneath their well-manicured lawn, who want to go back to how things used to be, even though their image of how things used to be is a total fantasy. And the longer we choose to ignore the darkness of our real past and how it still lives with us today, the longer we ignore the the darkness surrounding us and consuming us, the more we allow it to grow. This is the water, and this is the well. We have drunk full, and now we are descending. We have let the fire spread, and it has burnt the world almost to complete blackness. And if we let it go any further, then we will be left with the true horror at the end of the story of the little girl who lives down the lane. Now, I don't want to leave on total gloom. As horrifying as lunch is, as I said before, there has to be a balance. So let me shine some light. This idea, this necessity to confront darkness, it's not always as heavy as it seems. Season three still retains a lot of beauty and a lot of humor. A lot of the small bright moments of the series involve just getting to see someone learn from their mistakes and grow a little bit. Bobby gets over his teen angst and becomes a calm, responsible, honest person. Nadine realizes that she's not actually good for Ed and she's just keeping him around. So she lets him go, lets him find love. And of course he goes to Norma, who is probably the brightest point of this whole series for me. I mean, I love seeing Bobby's transformation, of course. But Norma, to me, shows a path forward. Norma doesn't save the world, you know. No, Norma follows a different path. Norma not only leaves her not-so-great boyfriend for Ed, but I think more interestingly and maybe more powerfully, she rejects expanding her store to other locations. 
it's made very clear that Norma's diner is less profitable than the other ones because she refuses to use the cheaper ingredients. She cares about creating something of value, something that will make other people happy. It's not just a trade that she's trying to make to get the most that she can. Her pies are her way of giving to the world, of giving happiness. And in Twin Peaks, pie, coffee, these are symbols of goodness, of the simple pleasures of life, the kind of things that Dale Cooper gets so excited over because he has that rare ability to really appreciate what is good about life. In some small way, Norma choosing love over capital gain preserves or even helps to slightly restore the balance of Twin Peaks just a little bit. So even when the world seems hopeless, there are always these little victories to be found in life, these little places to find joy. Whether it's a slice of cherry pie or a cup of damn fine coffee or some magnificent Douglas firs, a table full of donuts, it's important to slow down and to really appreciate the simple beauty of everyday life. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Every day, once a day, give yourself a present. Don't plan it. Don't wait for it. Just let it happen. It could be a new shirt at the men's store, a cat nap in your office chair, or two cups of good, hot, black coffee. Like this. A present. Like Christmas. <laughs>